I don't need to tell you how important the internet is to our daily lives. Whether it's for online shopping, banking, trading stocks, working remotely or watching this video right now on YouTube. This video is about a concept that puzzled mathematicians and computer scientists when it first came out. However, today the internet cannot function without it. This algorithm is what allows billions of devices and servers in data center to work properly. Without it, the phone, laptop, tablets and all electronic devices will stop working. Want to binge watch house of cards? Sorry, not possible. Want to text your friend on Instagram? Sorry, try again later. Downloading games? The server is overwhelmed. If you were the one to have a monopolistic rights to this algorithm, you would be a trillionaire. Enough to make Oppenheimer movie 10,000 times. But thankfully, it's freely available. Without it, it's almost impossible for Google, Microsoft, Amazon and thousands of other companies to work at such a massive scale. To really understand what it's about, we have to go back in history 200 years ago and ask this very simple question. Why do we need computers? Now, that might sound obvious to you due to millions of things that we do with computers that makes our life easy. But in 1800, there's no internet, there's no games or even chat GPT. So what would we use it for? Charles Babbage, essentially known as the father of computing, was really worried about the errors human made while calculating things in their daily lives. He saw it as an opportunity to design a machine that is free from error and can do various arithmetic faster than any human. So he spent few years designing his idea of difference engine with extreme details, as you can see in these pictures. But he never managed to build that nor the analytical engine which was supposed to be his second generation computer. Later, when the London Science Museum saw the Charles Babbage original drawings, they decided to reconstruct the machine. And the first one was made in 1991. And to me, it looks really cool. Coming back to 1890, the US census for the first time used electronic tabulators and punch card machine invented by Herman Hollerith, which would eventually become IBM. This machine was so successful that what might have taken 10 years to tally the data manually was reduced to 1 to 3 years because of it. As the time passed, major improvements in computer occurred during World War II, as you might have seen in the movie The Imitation Game. However, the fundamental problem with all of the machines at that time was they were designed for specific tasks. Once the machine was built, you couldn't do anything else with it. It's like making a program work using this breadboard. If you needed any other functionality, you would have to rewire it differently, which not only made things inefficient, but costed a heck lot of more money for what was essentially a giant calculator. John von Neumann, a polymath and someone who worked alongside with Oppenheimer on Manhattan Project, later in 1945 wrote a paper, the first draft on EDVAC, which listed every minute detail on how to build a stored program computer. Right from taking inspiration from how brain works to which part to use and how the circuit should be designed. This was the birth of general purpose computing or some might call it as the von Neumann architecture. Suppose you want to make a program that infinitely loop over itself and counts the number from zero to infinity. You can represent this code in assembly language which is one layer closer to binary ones and zeros. You can load this program into memory and let the CPU store the result in the accumulator. How fast the CPU will execute the program depends on the clock cycle, which is often related to how fast the vacuum tubes or transistor can switch back and forth. Now, this video isn't about a CPU and clock cycle, so if you are interested in it, I would highly recommend you to watch this video from Tom Scott about fetch, decode, execute cycle that occurs in CPU after finishing this video. How fast the computer will run is often determined by how fast the clock cycle is and especially the instruction set architecture like x86, ARM in Apple M1, IBM's SC90 chip, etc. Comparing the mechanical computer to digital computer after EDVAC was like comparing a horse car to Formula 1 car, which can go really fast. But you have to be cautious about how you handle it. One wrong move could prove fatal. In computing world, this precision is crucial and it's important that your program gets correctly executed as intended. When electronic computers were on the rise, programmers typically faced challenges on how to code a piece of software since programming as we knew today was extremely nascent. 
and only few people around Europe and the US knew how to work with these bulky machines. Edgar Dijkstra, whom you might recognize for his shortest path algorithm, was also the man who played a pioneering role in laying the philosophy of modern programming. In 1970, he delivered a lecture at Sorbonne University in Paris on how to deliver a program and keep it under tight control. On the way to his home, he delivered the same lecture at a large software company in Brussels, and it was a total failure. Later, he understood why. The company didn't want a faultless program because their income was dependent on the maintenance contract that they offered to their clients. The programmers weren't interested in it because they derived their intellectual excitement from the fact that they didn't quite know what they were doing. They felt like if you precisely knew what you were doing and didn't run risk, it was a boring job. Sounds painful, right? Earlier, computers could do one thing at a time. If the machine was reading the punch card to load the program, you couldn't simultaneously write on other punch cards. Your only option was to queue or batch programs one by one. But as computers started to become more powerful, there was a need to properly architect the software. What that essentially meant was, let's say in older generation CPU, when you read the data out of punch card or tape drive, the CPU usage might be 100%, but in newer model, that might be only 50%. So there should be a way to use other programs simultaneously to make efficient use of the machine. What we are essentially talking about is the concurrency, parallelism, or some might call it multiprogramming. The classic problem in computer science is that all applications have shared memory in which they store the initial data and the result. Let's say there's a number i which starts from zero. Two programs, one for addition and other for subtraction, share this common variable. Now, when you have a single CPU thread that can execute one program at a time, how would you decide which function will enter the CPU? Is it the addition or the subtraction? Also, how long will any one function will have access to CPU thread before interrupting temporarily to allow the other function to take over. Do you want this program to execute alternatively so the end result remains the zero? As you can see, even for such simple program, there are many ways that a program can be executed and it's easy to write a program incorrectly. So what would you do? One way to think about it is to make your program in such a way which allows the function to talk to one another so that both programs work properly. But what if one function fails and another one keeps on waiting for it? The answer is a scheduler that sits on top of the CPU. The scheduler acts as a traffic policeman that signals which program will get executed. Its switching should be fast enough that it gives you an illusion that two programs are running simultaneously. The job of this scheduler is kind of like this Japanese student parade, where everything should be executed flawlessly including handling errors. But wait, there's more. Today's operating system like Windows, Linux or Mac OS are all fancier versions of scheduler that makes it possible to run hundreds of programs at a given time. But we still haven't answered one question. How does a scheduler decide which program it should give access to and for how long? Well, that's a tricky and a really hard problem to solve since we cannot always predict the nature of program in advance. So a lot of computer scientists at that time approached it mathematically to keep a priority list and ensure each action is atomic or one at a time. The question really arises, do you really need execution to be atomic? As explained before, the problem was we had a common store of memory and when two programs try to read at the same time, there was no problem. The problem arises when two programs try to read and write at the same time, which is known as a race condition. So taking inspiration from Bakery and its ticketing system for handling many people in the queue, Leslie Lamport literally came up with the Bakery algorithm. What this did was to assign a ticket number to all the programs and lower number would grant it first entry. Today's computers uses vastly different and advanced versions of this algorithm to utilize all the cores your CPU has. But why really bother to go to such an extent to ensure that all the programs are working correctly? Because people's life depend on them. Five, 
four, three, two, one. On 20 July 1969, when Neil Armstrong and his fellow astronauts were about to land on the moon, there was a bug which caused a radio antenna to send unnecessary messages and started to overload the Apollo guidance computer several times during the landing. The computer restarted several times during the descent and displayed the famous 1202 error. Luckily, the computer was designed in such a way that it prioritized the landing program and halted the signal coming from radio antenna making the landing successful. Similarly, Therac 25, an X-ray machine, was programmed in assembly which had a race condition, causing it to release insane amount of radiation which caused the death of few people. Imagine flying in an airplane or getting an aid by ventilator. You wouldn't want the software to malfunction right. And that's why writing accurate programs are so crucial. Till now, we have seen how to synchronize processes and write a safe program on one single computer. But how about synchronizing a program on many independent computers that do their own thing? How would you approach that? Starting in late 60s and 70s, ARPANET was expanding throughout America, connecting various institutions and government organizations. Often for redundancy, businesses kept multiple copies of data spread in many geographic locations so that the user can access them reliably. Even in those times, replicating data reliably was a great challenge. In the paper on the maintenance of the duplicate database written in 1975 highlights the general guidance on how to keep data consistent and what should be the way in which a replication failure can be handled. However, Leslie Lampert observed that the main issue of the paper was it relied on physical clocks for keeping the ordering of the event. Since the clock in the computer could easily drift apart or denote wrong timing, it could violate causality, making data inconsistent across all replicated nodes. Even if you could approximate and round off the errors, that won't make any difference. Now, we all know what causality means in real-life physics. Everything has a cause and effect cycle that always travels towards the future. A raindrop fallen from the dense cloud cannot go back. Fuel burned to drive the piston in an engine cannot go back in time to recover that fuel. Similarly, you might be familiar with the notion of relativity where the time is perceived differently by the observers in different frame of reference for the same event. But how does that apply in computer systems? Let's assume that three people from US, UK and India are communicating on peer-to-peer -peer messaging app. All of them are talking about the 9-11 incident. The person in US types, Osama is alive, and broadcasts his message to his peers. While the message reaches in UK, due to network congestion, the message is slowly travelling to India. Meanwhile, after quickly reading, the person in UK types, no, he's already dead, which gets delivered to both the US and India. Soon after, the previous message also gets delivered to India. Now, the person in US and UK gets the same view of the conversation. But the person in India is rather confused as she doesn't know how to interpret the sequence of ordering of the messages. So how would you solve this problem? Leslie Lampard devised a way of using logical clocks instead of physical time to order the events. All three nodes will have an event counter starting from zero, which increments with each subsequent event. Now let's replay the action. Let's denote the counter as one from the US side which gets sent to the other users. After seeing the message and while sending a reply, the user in UK increments the counter to 2 and sends the message. We now see that the second logically ordered message arrives first in India than the previous one. Bringing all them together and assuming all the messages are tagged properly, it becomes really easy to sort them, achieving a consistent view across all the nodes. This way, we can ensure that all events stay synchronized across all the computer despite working independently. Remember, this is a very simplistic view of how events are being ordered. In reality, especially in today's modern computing, we have lots of sophisticated ways, each with their own trade-offs. You can find all of these examples on archive.org, which I'll link in the description. Leslie gave all of these details in his paper, Time, Clocks and the Ordering of the Event in a Distributed System, but he had his eyes on the big thing that was yet to come. 
For a long time, distributed systems were considered impossible due to their sheer challenges. Leslie proved that it was indeed possible to make a distributed system work correctly and created a Paxos algorithm in his paper, The Part-Time Parliament, which was first drafted in 1990. At its core, each node has a role of proposer, acceptor, and learner. A proposer proposes a value received by a user amongst other nodes. Then the other nodes decides if they want to accept the value or not. If they do, all of them become learner and register the value into their storage devices. It also includes the basic information on how to elect a leader so that it can maintain a single source of truth. Normally, when you interact with Google, Amazon or Netflix, what you essentially do is interact with their database via web server. 40 years ago, you would be restricted to only one or few databases. But because of Leslie's work, now you can add thousands of them and make your service available to billions of people on Earth. As the internet boom started in the 90s, this was the initial server Larry Page and Sergey Brin used to make Google live to public. You really don't go from this to today's giant data center deployed by Google all across the world without some serious engineering. And Paxos paved the way for today's internet architecture and helped thousands of companies across the globe to create enormous wealth. Leslie's paper focused on describing things mathematically rather than implementation, which also had a reputation of being difficult to understand. But it did give rise to many distributed consensus algorithms such as Multipaxos, Epaxos, Raft, and hundreds of other that developers use according to their needs. These algorithms are behind all the services in AWS and other cloud providers, MySQL, DynamoDB, HCD in Kubernetes, HashiCorp console, etc. They also power the HPC cluster which helps OpenAI to train ChatGPT and researchers to do their scientific computing and the list goes on. Leslie's work awarded him a Turing Award which is like a Nobel Prize for computing. So there you go. This was a basic demo or presentation on how a simple idea can inspire and change the world. So with that said, I really want to know how this video was. What was your feedback? Let me know in the comment box below. Uh, you can find all the links up for this video in the description. So make sure you do check them out. Again, the depth of this distributed system is much deeper than this ocean. And just like every video that I, that I say is, it's just basic if you haven't gone deep enough. So make sure. So make sure you just kind of really go in it, check uh, the sections. And with that said, I thank you for watching this video. Like, share, comment, and do the regular stuff. Till then, stay subscribed, and I see you next time. Bye.